Okay, so I, I really would like to thank the organizers for um, inviting me. Looks like a great conference. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about a few different things which are um, done, and at least related collaborations are done with uh, many different people that are uh, listed here. Most of them are from uh, Berkeley or have been uh, in Berkeley, uh, including two undergraduates. Uh, and, and also a collaboration with uh, Jamir Marino and his uh, postdoc Shane Kelly um, so, uh, from um, Mines. So uh, just, I don't think we need so much introduction that uh, recent platforms offer new ways to look at hidden aspects of quantum states and uh, quantum evolution. Uh, Google's uh, and various other scrambling experiments, uh, cold gas experiments with showing uh, entanglement entropies, uh, recent experiments on Rydberg atoms, and, and so on. And one of the things that are interesting in, in some of these experiments is the new, um, they force us to think uh, in deeper ways about quantum states, including what measurements, how measurements affect uh, quantum states. Uh, and I want to point out that, you know, measurements, as we know, have a very special role in quantum mechanics. They're one of the two possible fundamental evolutions according to the postulates of quantum mechanics. And they have a kind of non-trivial effect. On the one hand, they can destroy quantum correlations. For example, if I measure this cat state, then basically the cat becomes classical. But they can also create new longer range quantum correlations. For example, if, um, yeah, if this is, for example, in quantum teleportation, if initially I have a non local correlation between uh, some intermediate person and Alice here, and then another one between the same intermediate person, intermediate lab in another place, and I do some local measurement in a bell basis, then at, 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 in this lab, I create longer range correlations. And, and this assists together with um, classical, um, classical communication, it assists long range teleportation of quantum wave functions. So basically, measurement has these two effects of destroying and creating new quantum correlations. And it's interesting to think how these effects manifest when you apply them to many body wave functions. What new kind of phenomena you get from partial, partial measurements of correlated states. Um, so in this talk, I want to give a brief intro to measurement induced phase transitions and explain also why they're very hard to observe. Uh, the basic, we, even before I give uh, a, a, a preview, I want to, I, I want to say and, and maybe convince you that this phase transition is, is, can be summarized as the following kind of information transition. Alice throws a diary into some kind of scrambling circuit uh, and, you know, Bob at the end wants to read that diary and decode that diary, so there is an encoder here. Eve is making measurements and basically disrupting this uh, encoding. It's, she's making classical measurements, and you can ask whether part of Alice can still, in principle, be re reconstructed from Bob. So it, it, in a sense, there is an encoding, I, I want to claim that there is some encoding transition here. There is a, a rate of measure, a critical rate of measurement in which uh, the information about Alice is, is gone, okay, completely. Um, now, the problem is that this is very hard to observe for a reason I will explain. And then I want to claim that we can ask a, diff a slightly different question on almost the same circuit. Uh, but instead of Eve measuring uh, the final state, she keeps it on a quantum register and asks whether she can decode uh, Alice from uh, the measurement outcomes, whether Eve, not Bob, can decode. And I want to claim that there is a phase transition associated with the information flow in the circuit in, in this situation. Uh, and I, I will elaborate. And then in the end, if I have time, I, I hope I'll have time, um, but please ask me questions. So if I don't get to it, I'd be happy to talk to it uh, offline after that. 
uh, I, I want to ask a, a kind of a slightly different question, uh, closely related. Instead of looking at a quantum circuit, let's say an experimentalist gives me a quantum state, for example, a ground state of a critical system, and I want to ask how, if I make measurements on that state, and then immediately after making the measurement, I try to evaluate correlations in that state, how do the measurements affect the correlations? Because as I noticed, and I noted, uh, correlate, uh, measurements can have a non-local effect, so can they have a non-perturbative, non-local effect on critical correlations uh, in, in quantum ground states? That's, uh, and I, I want to claim that there is a phase transition associated with that, and um, maybe a unifying thread is that, uh, like this transition, it can also be observed in some cases. Um, so just before um, continuing, I'm going to talk about measurements in monitored system. I want to make a distinction between monitored systems and open systems. So usually I think people discuss open quantum systems. These are basically systems coupled to a bat. Uh, this describes, for example, usual decoherence processes. The, here, in, in this case, because of uh, coupling to the bat, the time evolution, even if you start with a pure state, will take you very quickly to a, immediately to a mixed state. So you need to describe it by some kind of mixed state evolution, like a, a, a Lindblad equation or Markovian, uh, in, the, in the case of a Markovian bat or a Krauss map. Monitored system, on the other hand, the time evolution for each realization of, you know, each world where we measure each run of the experiment, we have a pure state. If we start with a pure state, we continue with a pure state evolution. The observer, um, by observing, makes a partial projection of the wave function on, on the observed, observed state, but um, uh, the state remains pure from the, this process preserves the purity. Now, of course, we can't do anything with one shot. We have to do many shots. And to have this in any way different from being just coupled to a bat, the observer has to have the capacity to g use the information they gained by the experiment. So how can they use it? Either by next experiment post-selecting on, on results that they remember already occurred before, or by using some kind of feedback. But uh, they have to use that information. Otherwise, indeed, the monitored system is no different from a bat. Okay, so, so this is just a, like a disclaimer that you have to be uh, aware of all the time. Um, another thing is that, okay, uh, this is maybe a way to, to understand this um, uh, monitored system. Uh, we are creating, we are starting with a pure state, and when we measure, we project onto a pure state trajectory that depends on all the measurement outcomes. Now, if we have a large number of measurement outcomes and we need to post-select on them, this is going to be very, very hard because we're generating one branch in order to say anything about this branch. For example, measure expectation values, we need this branch to occur again and again and again, and of course that would be exponentially rare in the number of measurements. So if the number of measurements is hard, doing any experiment in the monitored system is hard. And I, I, I think that's, um, a, a lot of the talks today will discuss uh, ways to circumvent this kind of um, post-selection problem. Uh, but before getting into how to circumvent it, let's sh show that at least if in principle, uh, you know, philosophically, we have this quantum wave function in our hand. There is a nice, interesting phase transition in this uh, quantum wave function, and a really nice model to look at is a random unitary circuit, uh, which is interrupted by quantum measurement. So you have two of the possible fundamental dynamics of in quantum theory. You have uh, uh, unitary gates acting on qubits, and from time to time you have projective measurements that uh, take your system to uh, the new state, depending on the outcome of the measurement. And uh, there is an inherent randomness here, of course, uh, related to the Born probability of uh, obtaining a particular eigenvalue. So again, you generate this kind of trajectories, and we want to ask 
questions about individual trajectories, which is hard. You can also uh, ask about individual trajectories by averaging over trajectories, but you have to average some quantity that is nonlinear in the density matrix. Otherwise, it's like you're discarding the measurement outcomes. So an example of such a quantity, if you average over the different trajectories with their probabilities, what is the um, entanglement entropy of half the system in that particular trajectory, then average over the trajectories after evaluating the entanglement entropy of a single trajectory. That would be a property that would be interesting. It will tell you how much uh, non-locality you have here. And, you know, these papers uh, really started the field of measurement-induced transition by pointing out, uh, at least finding numerically initially, that there is a phase transition in the entanglement entropy. You see, if, if you had no measurements here, it would be just a unitary, unitary circuit, you'd expect the, uh, that the entanglement entropy grows linearly in time and saturates only at the you know, maximal entanglement entropy of volume law entanglement. It turns out that this is, this volume law, at least, at least the volume law scaling is robust to any, to a small amount of measurements or small probability of measurement per, per qubit. Uh, and you stay as a volume law, but then you, um, uh, at some critical value of the measurement rate, uh, you go to an area law phase. Then you saturate at some finite time to uh, um, measure to 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 an area law measure uh, an area law entanglement. And and this is, these are nice numerical results showing this phase transition. Um, later on, I won't talk about the statistical mechanics uh, model. Uh, uh, later, but uh, uh, a lot, but uh, an, a really nice thing about this model of using random unitaries and especially random Haar unitaries is that it allows to take the tensor network describing the dynamics and then average over the ensemble of networks. And uh, by doing this average, you get an effective spin model where uh, the um, phase transition between area law and volume law becomes a uh, phase transition between um, ferromagnetic and paramagnetic state in the, in the spin model. Um, the uh, calculation of the entanglement entropy corresponds to a particular boundary condition that forces a domain wall to go through the system. And, uh, you know, in the ferromagnetic state, the domain wall costs a linear energy and the uh, length of the domain wall in this two-dimensional time plus space geometry, while in the paramagnet, the domain wall free energy is, is cheap, it's, it's constant, and that's basically the uh, volume law versus area law entanglement. So it's, it's nice to have this kind of uh, statistical mechanics description. It gives a lot of intuition, and uh, it is allowed to, to um, find a lot of, make a lot more non-trivial predictions, although it still hasn't allowed us to completely understand the universality class of this phase transition. Okay. But I'm going, I'm not going to talk about it so much today. Today I want to actually um, focus on understanding this phase transition in, uh, at least for the first part of my talk, in terms of quantum information encoding. Um, so, what was pointed out in, in these papers is, is that, um, in fact, the reason that uh, the volume law phase is stable to some amount of measurement is that this, um, these unitary gates scramble and hide quantum information in a way that uh, if the measurements are not frequent enough, they're not revealing important information about the correlations between the two sides of the system, and therefore the entanglement entropy is not affected at all by the measurements. And that's why it can um, survive. Uh, it's really a phase, and, and another way to look at it is that um, there is a finite number of qubits that is, or sorry, a finite density of qubits that is propagating coherently through the system, and if you encode some message uh, in Alice's diary, for example, part of that message remains in the output state as long as the measurement rate is not too high, and at some critical measurement rate, uh, this mes message is no longer encoded, and uh, quantitatively, this is it's, it's described by uh, the quantum channel capacity of this model from Alice to Bob. 
There is another interesting perspective that I want to highlight now, uh, which is the perspective of the, the observer Eve. Now, Eve has measured the system, is measuring the system. If you do the experiment many, many times, it will have a distribution of measurement outcomes. Now, by looking at this classical distribution of measurement outcomes, you can ask if Eve can say something about uh, the initial state. Does it have uh, the maximal information it can gain about the initial state? So suppose Alice changes something in this diary, will Eve notice it by comparing the dis probability distribution of these sets of experiments? And it turns out that there is also a transition in that. This is called, uh, you, can, you can quantify it in terms of the classical Fisher information uh, in Eve's measurement outcomes. Uh, and again, this is, this is just a, sec, uh, you know, a different side of the same coin. Uh, it's exactly the same transition as can be seen in, in the statistical mechanics model. But again, all of this is very hard to observe for exactly the same reason I, I, noted, I, I noted before. Uh, it requires post-selecting, the first one requires post-selecting on an extensive number of measurement outcomes. Uh, and the second kind of um, observer perspective requires to reconstruct a distribution that you can, that is made of very, very small probabilities, exponentially small probabilities. So both of them require an exponentially large number of measurements. And um, this is prohibitively hard. And the question is whether there is some way to, um, to overcome this. So now instead of really overcoming this for this question, I want to ask a slightly different question and show that it also has an interesting uh, transition in the information, uh, and in this case, it is uh, observable. Uh, yes? Yeah, so before in the previous slide, um, so is there a guarantee that these two always have the same, these two criteria always have transition at the same point? Uh, yeah, so at least for high random circuits, we know that because we can map them to a statistical mechanics model, the bulk of the statistical mechanics model is identical. And it, it, these two objects just correspond to different boundary conditions. Yeah, there are different uh, order parameters. I guess in that case, case, you know there is only one transition. So yeah, yeah. But, but more generally, like I'm thinking that so the, the classical, I mean, is, is it possible that I, um, I I have the information um, already, the information already runs away from Bob, but uh, it's, it's in Eve, uh, but, it, but Eve cannot see much of it because it's only doing classical measurement? Yeah, it's, uh, it's a good question. I don't know if in the very general case it has to be that way. Maybe there is a way to kind of um, separate these two transitions. I, I, yeah, it's a good question. But in the simplest circuits that we can analyze, then I, I, we know it's, it's the same transition. Um, Okay, so now I want to look at the same circuit exactly. So you, you see the um, way Eve measures here is she basically uh, uh, couples some ancilla to the system. That's a kind of a natural way to measure. Let's do the same thing, uh, but let's leave the ancilla in place and not destroy them by measuring them. So Eve now holds a quantum state, and I can ask a question whether I can decode this information. By the way, this is, you know, you can think of that as a model of a black hole. Alice throws her diary to the black hole. I think this is a kind of a nice lingo that, um, or a nice um, story that that uh, um, was introduced by, by John Preskill and um, uh, Patrick Hayden some time ago. So, so this is a different situation. Alice throws, uh, throws her di diary into the black hole. Now, instead of someone being entangled with a black hole from primordial or very old uh, Hawking radiation, now instead, uh, someone like Eve is collecting the Hawking radiation as, as the system scrambles. And, and we want to ask a question whether at some point Eve has enough information to decode atoms, okay? Um, and you, you can imagine that this is very, closely related to the scrambling capacity of this black hole. And indeed, I want to uh, 
uh, claim that there is a scrambling phase transition in the scrambling capacity of this, uh, or how, how this black hole scrambles. So let's start from a unitary circuit and uh, think of this as a, some random unitary circuit. We um, have an operator that we uh, launch at some point t equals zero. Heisenberg evolves with this circuit. Uh, we, the way the operator grows is, so imagine just for simplicity now, a Clifford circuit, in which case the operator remains a Pauli string. It, it starts as a Pauli operator, for example, and it remains a Pauli string but it becomes a longer and longer Pauli string. Every time it hits a Clifford gate, which is not just swap, it starts, the, the operator splits into more operators, and, and there is a tree of operators that is, is generated, um, and, and it grows more and more, and you can uh, evaluate how many non-trivial objects are in this tree in a branch by uh, calculating the out of time order correlation between this evolved operator and some test operator somewhere. So I, I'm going to call this um, OTOC, which is the, you know, the uh, just the commutation relation squared, um, the operator density. And the sum over that is just the, is the operator size. If I sum over the entire tree, I kind of count branches up to some statistical prefactor. Okay, so, so this is just, and, and one would expect that this would grow linearly in time if, if the system is very, very scrambling, it will just grow linearly in time, like the light cone uh, dynamics of this operator. Um, um, and indeed, you, you see it. This is, this is an example of such an operator. It grows, and um, I just plot, uh, the color map basically plots this, uh, this for a particular realization of the circuit. Okay. Um, but now let's uh, change the circuit and um, allow from time to time to swap out a bit, uh, swap a bit out and insert a bit from, from the environment or from, from the, right, from an external bit into, into the black hole. And in this case, as I increase the, um, number of, of the, the probability of C, these swaps, I kill more and more branches of the tree. Every time I swap out uh, um, a bit, when the operator evolves, if there is an operator on that branch, that branch is killed, okay, that branch of the tree. And you can exactly, essentially exactly map this to a directed percolation problem, or like a wetting problem. Uh, and in, and we know for a wetting problem or a directed percolation problem, there is a critical value PC at which the tree doesn't percolate anymore and, and stops. And this, is, uh, and this is the transition you'll see. You'll see, and, and indeed, when you calculate this in the Clifford circuit, I, I explained it in a Clifford circuit, but I should point out that Clifford circuit and how random circuit for the autox are the same thing, because uh, there are two design, up to two design, the two circuits are equivalent. Um, but here is a simulation of, of this um, auto uh, density, operator density as a function of time at the critical P, exactly. And you see that it can, at uh, different times, at different times, if I take cuts at different times, they scale perfectly with directed, expo uh, directed core, uh, Directed percolation exponents. Uh, what is it? There are no measurements at all here. There is not a single measurement. No, not tracing out. Just made, oh, it's a very good question. So we're not tracing out the ex environment. We think of these swaps as just part of the unitary system, and the environment is part of the unitary system. So when we uh, look at the backward in time evolution, it includes also the swaps. Yeah. There is no measurement at all, okay? It's a unitary circuit. Think of the swaps as unitaries. The, swap, the swaps are unitary operators. So think of the entire system, including environment and system. No, 
Yeah, if I look at observables just in the system, I can, it might as well trace, trace out. But, the, but these are just usual observables. Autox are not like that, because autox you need, you cannot, if I trace out the environment, I'll get a non-unitary evolution, I can't even define autox, okay? So autox are not, right, for autox, I need to think of this whole thing as a unitary network and never trace out. Okay, here there is a transition, very easy to see, right? And the reason for the transition is that you swap out, when you swap out an operator, you kill a branch. Okay, so there is a transition, there is a directed percolation transition. So we can discuss later what is the difference, but here there is obviously a transition, both numerically, but also, you know, you can show it analytically. It's a very robust transition. There is another question. No, no, to, to do the mapping, you don't really need it in this case. Uh, for Clifford, so for Clifford, you can actually calculate and get an exact classical mapping. And then you can argue that with, uh, with, with random har, you get the same thing for the autoc at least. Um, you can also, uh, take large D random har and, apply and get the same model, and then one over D corrections turn out to be irrelevant, unlike in the, so. Um, there are, anyway, they, they just quickly, you can also go off criticality and see the two scaling functions off criticality for the operator density as a function of time, and they also fit perfectly with directed, uh, directed percolation exponents. Okay, so I, I this is, uh, in a transition in scrambling. Already it's observable in principle if you have a quantum computer. It's hard because you need to take time backward and forward and so on, but you don't have any post-selection problem. So it's, at least it's not fundamentally impo impossible to see. It's just hard. Um, so uh, I, I told you it's related to an information transition, a decoding transition, and I want to um, say, it. so one can show that also uh, so um, the decoding transition is the question of whether Eve can decode Alice with perfect fidelity using the following specific scheme. And the specific scheme is simply Eve takes the, uh, her wave function and feeds it into U dagger, okay, with some, any kind of initial state. Now she guesses the initial state and takes it into the inverse time evolution, okay. The initial state is like, output state of, of this, but she doesn't know it, so she got, just inputs anything. And it turns out that she can still perfectly decode Alice after some, um, after some time. Um, this is the decoding, the, this is the fidelity of decoding. So this is the wave function. Alice starts in some wave function uh, at AS1. And uh, now you want to take the overlap of Alice and S2. S1 prime um, with, with the output state of this encoder plus decoder system. And uh, this is the tensor network di diagram. It turns out to be very, very similar to the tensor network diagram for the autoc um, that I, I showed you. And both of them have a transition at the same time. Again, it's just boundary conditions are different and the bulk is the same. Uh, so, and, and here is uh, numerics, uh, you see that there is a, at the critical value, which is exa exactly the directed percolation value, the, the uh, fidelity of um, reconstruction becomes one. One can also ask if there is a transition in the quantum channel capacity between Alice and Eve, if there is a decoding transition. And here there is something more subtle. There is a transition in the quantum channel capacity between uh, Alice and Eve, but only if Eve has complete zero knowledge about the initial state of her qubits. If she ha has some knowledge, for example, one can show very, you know, very easily, if she uh, has a pure initial state, then there cannot, then she all, she can always reconstruct Alice both above and below PC after a sufficiently long time. But 
oh, uh, there is a transition in this um, um, uh, quantum channel capacity only if she has no knowledge of the initial state. Okay, so uh, I, I'm done with this part of the talk, um, and I have a short last part, but any questions about this? Yes. Yeah, don't. Thank you. Does the location of the um, transition coincide with the um, direct population of the lattice? Um, the, yeah, the, I'm trying to, uh, I, well, it's not, the model is directed percolation-like, not exactly directed percolation, because it has some correlations uh, between the, you know, probabilities for going, um, so, so the different probabilities of, of uh, splitting, going right and going left are not uncorre completely uncorrelated. So I'm, I'm not sure it's going to be the same, exactly the same okay. transition. But yeah. you did see... Uh, exactly the same transition point. Okay, but, but the exponents are the but same. But the exponents are the same, yes. Okay, thank you. Hi. Um, when you have a phase transition, I mean, I would expect somehow there's some underlying non-analytic feature in the wave function. So can you rationalize, I mean, why it's in some observables present and in others not? Um, in some observables... Uh, or, I mean, you mentioned it depends on the initial state. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, so yeah, so, so, but this is not observables, right? It's, um, it's an information measure. If the initial state, if the, the, if the, the initial state is known here, then Eve, Bob, and Alice together have a pure state. And uh, that's basically the difference is that you have a completely different Hilbert space. On the other hand, when you have a, a totally mixed state, then there is another system that I don't write here where that Eve is perfectly uh, coupled to. So the Hilbert space is actually different in this case. So we can we can discuss it. Yeah. Uh, yes. Question. Yeah. Um, do you have any proposals on what happens in Hamiltonian systems? Because in this case, if you do swaps, you presumably increase the energy of the system, right? And it hits up to infinite temperature. Well, in all of, yeah, so that's why I think it really doesn't matter if it's a Hamiltonian system or not, because the system becomes immediately non-Hamiltonian when you add this uh, feature in it. So I don't think really Hamiltonian system makes any difference whether you do it in a Hamiltonian system or not. One more. Um, so this is a bit technical, but so if I think about the random uh, uh, circuits, uh, then the transition is like a like a transition of uh, icing ordering. Then I thought, uh, uh, like in the case with the thermal bus, you don't have the transition because the bus behaves like an external field. So uh, I just want to understand like why in this setup that disappeared, like somehow it uh, behaves like a pure state. Yeah, actually, here, if you map this, it's a very good question. So, so here, if you map this to a, a right, so how does it work? Yeah, if you map to a, a, first of all, this is not an Ising transition. It's, it's a directed percolation transition. But there is a um, very big, there is a big difference depending on whether this is, um, uh, one or not, because actually if you write down the tensor network diagram, there are two boundary conditions on the output state and then the input state of every qubit where you swap. Uh, there is a um, like a swap boundary condition on the top and there is another boundary condition on the bottom. If it's a no swap boundary condition on the bottom and a swap boundary condition on the top, these two exactly give you kind of no boundary condition. And, uh, and allow a phase transition while, so, so this is related. So that's why you need a perfect, from this you can understand that you really need a perfect, uh, um, infinite temperature state here, zero knowledge. If you have a little bit of knowledge, you break this boundary condition, uh, break the symmetry in the boundary condition. Okay, can I go on? How long do I have? I guess I have about five minutes, so it'll be uh, like... A, yeah, 10 to the very end. 10 minutes, okay. Okay, so now I'm going to open a new page. I, I want to discuss something 
a little different. Uh, I want to ask how measurements affect quantum critical correlations. And this is basically the motivation is that measurements do something non-local, but they do something non-local provided that your, the state they act on have some non-local entanglement in it already. And so, so the first thing we wanted to try is what they, how they affect critical ground states because they have kind of long range entanglement in them built in. So, so w here we have no dynamics. Given a quant we are given a quantum state, for example, by an experimentalist. We measure a subset of the qubits. Here is this ground, uh, quantum state uh, depicted pictorially, like a matrix product state, for example. We apply some measurements somewhere, and we get a new state following the measurements. The measurements disentangle some of the qubits. And now, after that, we want to evaluate some correlation function. This is, in principle, again, suffering from the same post-selection problem. And in the end, I want to discuss how it can be avoided. Uh, an example, a, a physical example, could be, for example, uh, uh, th that I will concentrate on in this talk, um, would be detection of particles in a 1D quantum liquid, for example, using light, light beams. So suppose we have some resolution where we can see whether there is a particle or not, um, and, and the light couples sufficiently weakly so that we can consider this as a, as a weak measurement of the particle density, local particle density. Um, so let me give you a quick background on one-dimensional quantum liquids. Um, in, at zero temperature, they have a universal long wavelength description in terms of a Luttinger liquid. Um, you can describe them in a dual way, either using the phase fluctuations of, of the liquid, if you imagine Bose liquid, but it doesn't matter, it could be a fermion or Bose liquid. Uh, the phase fluctuations are harmonic and um, describe this critical state in one dimension, or you can describe it in terms of, you can think about the particle positions as some masses on a spring, and, and this is described by this displacement field, and it's also a dual harmonic description, uh, and you see this parameter k appearing here in a dual way, um, and it completely determines the long wavelength correlations in the system, which are all power law correlations. And, and they're set by the Latinger parameter. Um, the, in, in this long wavelength description, phi, the density is related to the gradient of phi plus corrections that correspond to the fact that we have discrete particles. So we can uh, use this dictionary to uh, describe density correlations using this quantum field, the, the long wavelength field phi. Uh, in this case, k equals 1, that interparameter 1 corresponds to non-interacting fermions or hardcore bosons. k less than 1 is fermions with repulsive interactions or bosons with some longer range repulsion. Um, and this has been uh, uh, shown in experiment, these power law correlations have been shown in experiment. This is a quantum critical state with continuously tunable exponents. The density correlations, for example, have two components. One component that decays smoothly without oscillations, and that decays like a universal 1 over x squared, uh, while the um, oscill oscillating part of the density correlations decay with a non-universal exponent that is continuously tunable by, the Latin, by this Latinger parameter. Phase correlations also decay like 1 over x to some power that, again, is tunable by the Latin parameter. Again, you see that phase and, um, and the field phi are, are dual to each other. This decays with an exponent 2k, this one 1 over 2k. Okay, um, okay so now let's add measurements. So someone gives us this ground state. We do weak measurements. And for now, let's look at the following type of measurement. If the outcome is 1, it means that we found a particle. So the measurement could be, for example, polarization state of the photon. If the polarization changes to 1, it means that I found a particle in this location. If it came out 0, we call it no click. It doesn't mean that there is no particle, it just means that maybe either there is no particle or the photon has just not interacted with the particle. So, so it, the particle occupation remains indefinite in this case, but is biased a little bit towards having no particle there. Um, 
And the question is, how do, do such partial weak measurements affect the critical correlations? After I do this measurement and immediately evaluate the correlations, will they still be decaying with the same powers? Okay, that's the question. Um, um, again, no dynamics. I just immediately after I measure, I, I evaluate the correlations. So as a warm up, let's look at the simplest situation where we post select on the null measurement outcome, no clicks at all. Right? This, if, if the interaction is weak with the photons, it's, it's not such, it's a rare event, but out of all the rare events, it's the least rare event. But, so, um, no click state is described in a simple way. That's one motivation to look at it. It's basically like imaginary time evolution of the ground state. It's a partial projection on some state where n is, is the normal order density. It's a density with respect to the, um, average density. Um, and the long wavelength description of that, if, um, if the measurement strength has an oscillating in space component that is commensurate with the particle density in this case, and I, I do it just because it's the simplest case now, uh, then this has uh, a long wavelength form, uh, this has this long wavelength form. Okay, so this is the state, this is what we call the non, no click state. And now I want to ask whether the no click state has the same correlations as the state I started with or different correlations. Okay, this is the no click state up to normalization. Now I can evaluate the correlations. So evaluating the correlations, to evaluate the correlations, I have to, I can do it in the following way. I can uh, construct the ground state by applying an infinite imaginary time evolution with a Latinger liquid Hamiltonian on some reference state then do the partial projection, evaluate the correlations. Now, this, these two evolutions I can um, fraternize and write as some um, average in some effective action, which let's call the no-click action. And the form of this action, it's not hard to convince yourself, is simply that. It's simply this bulk action associated with the Latinger liquid. And then there is part of the action that, that acts only at some finite, you know, short time near tau equals zero and, and corresponds to the um, no click projection. Okay. This is, so, so this is how it looks. But this is basically the same thing, a wick rotated quantum impurity problem where again we have a bulk action which is the same and we have a quantum impurity action that acts at a single point in space but at all imaginary times. This is a problem that was, uh, you know, a very famous problem that uh, Matthew Fisher and uh, Charlie Kane looked at uh, back in, in the 90s. And, you know, the solution is well known. And because of um, Lorentz symmetry here, we will basically get the same results. We can do um, the RG and, and find that the measurements are either relevant or irrelevant depending on the Latinger parameter. These density measurements are relevant only, for, are irrelevant for K greater than one attractive interactions, it means that long distance correlations are completely unaffected. Even if we do very strong measurements, they will affect the short distance behavior, but there'll be a crossover to uh, the usual correlations at sufficiently long distance. Um, actually, we have examples of numerics where it works very nicely. We can even predict what would be the long uh, the correlations at, there is a universal crossover that you can predict based on this strong coupling to weak coupling RG. Um, the more interesting case is when K is less than one, in which case the measurements are relative, uh, are relevant, and they have a non-perturbative effect on the long distance correlations. And after, you know, after the measurements, you measure the correlations, they're completely different, okay? Okay, five minutes left, I'm nearly done. Um, Okay, uh, this was a warm up. What we really want to look at is an ensemble of measurement outcomes. In this case, to implement the averaging over the random measurement outcomes, you need to introduce n replicas again and then take the replica limit n to one. Uh, the basic thing that you get is kind of similar. You still have a bulk action, but now a bulk action of n replicas and the um, uh, boundary Boundary uh, impurity at tau equals zero, again, is, is, is there, but now it, it's uh, trying to pin the replicas together. This is this cosine. 
Again, you can do uh, RG analysis for all replicas, and you find that for all replicas, the critical value of the Latinger parameter where this spinning term is, is important is k equals half. So in this case, k equals one will be irrelevant measurements and only below k uh, equals half, they'll become relevant. Um, okay, but again, I told you that these are hard to observe. Sorry, I, I had some numerics, but I, I'll sh I can show you uh, offline. Um, you can ask how to uh, observe this transition. Again, the transition is um, hard to observe in principle because what you need to look at are nonlinear correlation functions like this, like uh, the phase phase correlation squared. Otherwise, you basically it's the same as not doing measurements. It's just like dephasing, and of course, then you'll not have any effect. Um, so how do you do that? Um, well, um, so again, this is unobservable, but let's look at, at an alternative linear quantity, which is a sum over PM now of the usual correlation function, but weighted by some W of M that use, utilizes some knowledge of the measurement outcomes. Okay, so this uh, correlation function where we reweight by some weight, which we need to specify, is already observable. It's it's a linear. Uh, this average sigma m pm is something that is basically replaced by an average over shots, uh, by a, a averaging over shots. So now what is wm? Okay, one uh, natural choice of wm, if we can calculate the system classically, is to take the um, conditional correlation function, for example, the phase conditional phase correlation function that we have here, in the in in for example the quantum Monte Carlo calculation, right? So given a set of measurement outcomes, we can uh, now restrict the Monte Carlo calculation and find the um, this correlation function, and, and now we observe the transition through this cross correlator, cross estimator, quantum classical estimator, where this is the W and this is what we evaluate in every shot. And, and if you notice, this has this uh, um, interesting cross replica, it's like a cross replica correlation function where one replica is your classical calculation and one replica is the uh, quantum calculation. Okay. And uh, so to summarize, I, I've shown you that I, I, I reviewed the measurement induced phase transition. We saw that it's really an encoding phase transition, but it's hard to observe. Um, I showed you that if you can ask, if you ask a slightly different question, uh, you find the decoding transition that is in principle easy to observe. Um, and then I, I showed you that um, making partial measurements on quantum critical states can alter the long range critical correlations in a non perturbative way. Uh, this is seen by mapping to boundary critical phenomena, uh, and it's observable through this quantum classical estimator. And one question that this raises is, is it possible to show that, um, show quantum advantage using quantum classical estimators? Um, for example, can we have instances in which the classical classical estimator, basically just a complete classical simulation is hard, uh, but the uh, classical quantum estimator is easy. That could happen, for example, because maybe it's hard, harder to, cal to generate, to calculate the probabilities in the classical system, um, uh, while in the classical quantum estimator, you don't need to calculate the uh, probabilities because the sampling is done for you automatically by the quantum computer. But in situations we now understand, there is only a polynomial gap between these two. So um, it's an open question whether one can do some, can have a situation where it's better. Okay, thank you very much, Edgar. Thank you. Okay, maybe just one or two questions. Uh, so I have a question about the second part, the decoding transition. Um, yeah. If the initial states of Eve and uh, Bob are only classically correlated, uh, the second picture? Like the, the decoding second transition. Yeah. Eve and Bob actually, um, Bob doesn't have, in this case, if you Bob never actually has any information by 
by himself of, of Alice. So, Sorry, so, I meant even Bob. Oh, even Bob? Yeah, the initial states of even Bob are classically oh. correlated. They're not correlated. The initial states are not correlated. You can, in principle, yeah, yeah, put yeah. any initial state here for the transitions I, I, in the scrambling. The initial states don't matter, actually, for, matter. for the autoc. Sorry, so if I put them in, say, some EPR state or something, Bob and Eve, that yeah. would not destroy the transition? No, actually, the, for the autoc, you can say it's completely independent of the initial state for the autoc. For the, um, this decoding transition, it's also independent of the initial state. What really matters, where the initial state matters is the quantum channel capacity between Alice and Eve, which is sort of like a algorithm independent measure of the information. For that, it matters, the initial state matters. Thanks. Um, so for this, again, um, in the decoding transition, part of your talk, um, I guess the swap gate is a bit special, right? Because that's what allows the operator to fall out of Bob's part of the system and be completely localized with Eve. Because in, in general, if your system back interacted with some kind of process, the operator would live on both after the, after the system back interaction. Yeah, but you can actually have the same transition also if you apply a random har, but then you have to you have to set it up a little bit carefully and, and you can also have a transition with random har. Do you uh, have any intuition as or, to why? Or, because the intuition you presented was very specific to the fact the operator falls out of bars. Yeah, but here also part of the op operator falls out. So if you have it enough, so, uh -huh. so actually what you have to do is yeah. you, if you, Let's take time steps, be big, and between each time step, you have opportunity to have more than one random har between uh, um, uh, your, your physical qubits and, and the environment. In this case, there would be a, a critical value of the number of, you know, expected number of swaps, uh, not swaps, random hars between them that will give you the same transition. And there we can, if for this random har, we can also get the same kind of uh, statistical mechanics model that gives you, um, but, but yeah, and, and because it's not a full swap, you need to have more than one of those to, to be above the percolation transition. Okay, thanks. Yeah. To, to be able to go above the percolation transition. Okay, I think given the late hour, and I'm sure of some hunger pangs in some of us, uh, let's thank uh, both of the speakers.